Um, we then have Sisbus, who uh, threw that ox um, 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 uh, foot hoof at Odysseus, and we have a second round of killing, and it will be the cowherd then who will stab Sisyphus, and he will gloat over and triumph over his body, sounding very much like land, uh, moments from the Odyssey, or from the Iliad, line 300 and following. Love your mockery, do you, son of that plow hard, uh, of that blow hard, um, um, Polytheros. He says, no more shooting off your mouth, you idiot, such big talk. Leave the last word of the gods, they're much stronger. Take this spear, this guest gift, for the cow's hoof you gave once King Odysseus begging in his house, right? Um, in other words, that's for the, the cow's hoof from book 20, line 335, you'll remember. We have a third round of killings, and then Athena is going to make them go insane and panic. We're told at line 315 or so, the suitors out of their, mouth, out of their minds, down the hall they panicked, wild, like herds stampeding, driven mad as the darting gadfly strikes in the late spring when the long days come round. The attackers struck like eagles. We have several similes here. By the way, that gadfly response, or a gadfly word, write this in your notes. Uh, Plato knew this line very well, of course, and he likens Socrates to a gadfly in the famous dialogue apology. We'll get to it later. We're told they're like eagles, hook clawed, hook beaked, swooping down, Basically, they're just jacking these poor innocent guys now who are, of course, running away. And this will be one of the questions. Okay, okay, okay. Dude, you killed all the major guys. They're all dead now. What about all of the other guys? You're going to slaughter every last one of them? And the answer is, you bet. Every one of them goes down. They're all dead, except for, at the very end, we have Leodes. Leodes now, light 325. He flung himself at Odysseus clutched his knees. Now one of the reasons why I'm convinced this is the heart of the Odyssey is because it raises a lot of moral questions. When Dante writes his Divine Comedy and especially the Inferno, which we will study later, the question wasn't, does Odysseus deserve to be in hell, Inferno, but where, for what crimes does he deserve? And obviously Odysseus has pretty much done all of the Christian crime, you know, sins that we can imagine. Where will Dante put him? When we get there, we'll study it. But here, I think this is a pivotal moment. We have Leodes, who we saw earlier. I mean, he's kind of wimpy. He can't string the bow. And Atenas uh, will make fun of him. And Leodes now. He flung himself at Odysseus, clutched his knees, the supplication, crying out to the king with a sudden winging prayer, I hug your knees, Odysseus. Let's not forget Odysseus has done this a few times in his own, in, in, his own, uh, in the poem itself, in his, in his own life. I hug your knees, Odysseus. Mercy, spare my life. Never, I swear, did I harass any women in your house. Never a word, a gesture. Nothing. No, I tried to restrain the suitors. Whoever did such things, you'll remember that, in fact, Leodes told them after he couldn't string the bow, this is the weapon of death, and we're all going to die because of it. He says they wouldn't listen, keep their hands to themselves, so reckless, so they earned their shameful fate. In other words, all these men get what they deserve. But I was just their prophet. My hands are clean, and I'm to die their death? Look at the thanks I get for years of service. We're told then, a killing look, and the wry soldier answered, only a priest? A prophet for this mob, you say? How hard you must have prayed in my own house that the heady day of my return would never dawn. My dear wife would be yours, would bear your children. For that, there's no escape from grueling death. You die, at line 340. And then, snatching up in one powerful hand a sword left on the ground, Angelus dropped it when he fell. Odysseus hacked the prophet square across the neck, and the praying head went tumbling into the dust like Dolan in the Iliad, um, um, in Iliad 10. Odysseus just chops off his head. Like Achilles in Iliad 21, with Lycaon, that poor, <laughs> that poor kid who begs for his life, Odysseus will jack him. I think the poet knows exactly what he's doing. I mean, even look at the names. We don't have a lot of L names. We have a lot of names starting with E, for example. Don't have a lot of L names in either the Iliad or the Odyssey. Notice it's Laodice in the Odyssey, it is like Kaon in the Iliad, in the Iliad, and in both counts you have a pretty, pretty kind of. I mean, it's it's one of those things where you okay, okay, you've given yourself up. Really, not that bad of a guy, and yet notice the poet, uh, the the, uh, the the warrior Odysseus will jack the prophet. Now we're told, line three forty-seven. 
One was left, and I, and I said in my opening lines, uh, in my opening comments about the Odyssey, in my estimation, this is the heart of the Odyssey, and so much is being said here right now. Odysseus, is this heroic? Killing this supplicant? He says, I'm going to kill you for what you hoped maybe you could do, to get my wife and have children with her and take over everything that was mine. There was one left, trying still to escape like death. Phemius, of course, the bard, who always performed among the suitors, You'll remember Odysseus when he arrived at the palace. He heard the song of Phemius for the first time. They forced the man to sing. There he stood, backing into the side door, still clutching his ringing lyre in his hands, reminding us, of course, of this the whole thing about the lyre. When Odysseus strung his bow, it was like a lyre, you bet. When uh, Odysseus went to meet Achilles in Iliad 9, Achilles was playing a lyre that he had stolen from a city, you'll remember, and he was playing on that lyre songs about old heroes, dead heroes. His mind was in turmoil, we'll tell this poet. What should he do? Steal from the hall and couch at the... This is, we're back to this whole thing of between skill and charybdis. What do I do? What do I do? Steal back and crouch at the altar stone of Zeus, who guards the court where time and again Odysseus and Laertes burned the long thighs of oxen, or throw himself on the master's mercy, clasp his knees. In other words, do exactly the same thing that Laertes just did. That was the better way. Dude, did you not just see what happened to Laertes? He does it anyway. So he goes up, he grasps his knees... And so, he, before he does that, the cradling, he's cradling his hollow lyre. He lays it on the ground between the mixing bowl and the silver-studded throne. I think everything here is intentional. He lays the, the uh, musical instrument. We, we remember the Demodocus, the blind bard, hung his on all. Here he lays it on the floor between the mixing bowl, that is to say between the drinking, and the star, silver-studded throne, that is to say the seat of power. Rushes up to Odysseus. Claps, uh, clutches his knees at line 360, singing out to his king with a stirring wing in prayer. In other words, the poet knows how to sing. I hug your knees, Odysseus. Mercy, spare my life. The exact same thing Laodice said. What a grief it will be to you for all the years to come if you kill the singer now. Taking us back to the song of the Sirens, they invited Odysseus to stay and listen to songs about himself. Here he says, if you kill me, I will never be able to sing any songs about you later. Notice he says it. What a grief it will be to you for all the years to come if you kill the singer now who sings for gods and men. I taught myself the craft, but a god is planted deep in my spirit all the paths of songs. Songs I'm fit to sing for you as a god. Calm your bloodlust now. Don't take my head. You'd bear me out. Your, your, your own dear son. He'd bear me out. Your own dear son Telemachus. Never of my own will. Never for any gain. Did I perform in your house, singing after the suitors had their feasts? They were too strong, too many. They forced me to come and sing. I had no choice. We're told Telemachus says, This one's innocent as well as the herald Medon. Save them both, and Odysseus will send them out and say, You're fine. Medon will come out of hiding. Odysseus uh, will give a smile, we're told, break into a smile. He will say at line 393, Courage, he says, the prince has pulled you through, he saved you now, so you can take it to heart and tell the next man to. And then he, a very interesting line uh, at, um, right, uh, right before line 400, Clearly doing good puts doing bad to shame. We're going to come back to this line. <laughs> Odysseus obviously thinks that what he's doing and slaughtering all these men is doing good. Now leave the palace and go and sit outside, out in the courtyard, clear the slaughter, you and the bard with all of his many songs. Wait till I'm done with household chores. And that call for my attention. Household chores? That is to say we got to clean this place up because it's gross because all these people are slaughtered and dead. Everybody is dead. And we're given an interesting word picture at line 440. He found all of them, one in all, one in all in blood and dust. Great hauls of them, down and out like fish. This is an interesting epic simile. Like fish that fishermen drag from the churning gray surf and looped in coiling nets. Fling ashore on a sweeping hook of beach, some noble catch heaped on the sand, twitching, lusting for, for, for fresh uh, salt sea. Some of them are still twitching. But the sun god hammers down and burns their lives out. So the suitors lay in heaps, corpse covering corpse. And then Telemachus um, um, is told by Odysseus, go call Eurycleia and get her here. He runs to get Eurycleia. He says, Dad wants a word with you. She finds Odysseus in the thick of slaughtered corpses, splattered with blood filth like a lion, another simile that's devoured some ox of the field. We saw this one a lot, didn't we, in the Iliad? And Lopes home covered with blood, his chest streaks, both jaws glistening, dripping red, a sight to, uh, to strike terror. So Odysseus, line 430, look now, splattered with gore, his thighs, his fighting hands, and she, when she saw the corpses, 
all the pooling blood was about to lift a cry of triumph. Um, both uh, Eurycleia as well as Penelope seemed to have no problem as women of the day, no problem with the slaughter of all of these and seeing it even. She's ready to shout a cry of triumph. Here was a great exploit, look, but the soldier held her back and checked her zeal with warnings winging home. Odysseus says, rejoice in your heart, O woman, peace. No cries of triumph now. It's unholy to glory over the bodies of the dead, which is so counterintuitive, because when Odysseus jacks Dolan in, in, um, in Ilia 10, that's exactly what he does, right? I mean, uh, um, he, he, I mean, he colloats all the time, as do all kinds of warriors. These men... The doom of the gods is brought low, and their own indecent acts. They no regard for any man on earth. Again, the apologetic uh, Odysseus trying to explain by apology. I don't mean that he's ex uh, saying sorry. He's saying this is why I did what I did. He says they no regard for any man on earth, good or bad, who chanced to come their way. And so, thanks to their reckless work, I told you when we began the Odyssey, it's all about the blame game. Notice Zeus started the Odyssey by saying, bad stuff happens to men, and it's not my fault. And Aegisthus is, of course, mentioned as being the one who got jacked after, um, you know, um, after he killed uh, Agamemnon in Agamemnon's homecoming. And so, thanks to the reckless work, they meet this shameful fate. Quick, report in full on the woman in my halls who were disloyal to me, who are guiltless. And she will say, well, there's 50 women, 12 of them are bad. Um, and then she says, can I please go and get Penelope? And Odysseus says, no. What I want are those 12 women. Bring them in. So that's exactly what happens. Um, the, um, Telemachus then will um, go and get uh, uh, along with the two herders uh, and they start cleaning up. The second cleaning of the day, by the way, notice at book 20, line 170, Euryclea already had them clean up the hall once, now we got a different one. The women came out of the great hall, they are, or we're told, march the women out of the great hall. This is Odysseus speaking to Telemachus now at line um, 463, uh, uh, sorry, 467. March the women out of the great hall between the roundhouse and the courtyard start, uh, strong stockade after they've cleaned up, in other words. Hack them with your swords, slash out all their lives, blot out of their minds the joys of love they relished under the suitors' bodies running on the sly. In other words, for sleeping with all these men, uh, sexual uh, acts, we will ultimately cut them to pieces. The ironies run deep because, of course, Remember, Odysseus didn't want to leave Circe. He so much enjoyed sleeping in her bed. It was Odysseus's men that had to convince him. Remember when we hit those lines? And yet here we go, the sexual double standard. In other words, they will be called sluts and whores. Odysseus will never consider himself this way because he was quote-unquote forced to. Well, technically so were these poor girls as well, right? Um, it's pretty obvious that for most of them anyway. These poor doomed women are brought out. They're wailing convulsively when they walk out. You can imagine, see 118 men just dead, or at least 100 or so men dead, slaughtered. They have to do several things. First, they have to carry out all the bodies. Think of that. Many of those men, of course, are their lovers. Carry out the bodies. Then they're forced to scrub down everything. Then at line four, um, 480, they have to carry that filth out. And then it lasts. Once the entire house was put in order, they marched the women out of the great hall, that is to say Telemachus, between the roundhouse and the courtyard strong stockade, crammed them into a dead end, no way out from there, and stern Telemachus gave the men their orders. No clean death for the likes of them by God, not for me. They showered abuse on my head, my mother's too. And then he says it to them at line 490, you sluts, the suitors whores. With that, taking a cable, he will um, run it over, and he will hang every last one of them. So all might die a pitiful, ghastly death. They kicked up heels a little, not for long. Whoa. So in other words, these women all have to go through the disgusting process of cleaning up all of the blood and guts, and then they're routinely taken out, and all 12 women are hanged by Telemachus. Melanthus? Well, line 500, and this is the most disturbing, I think, of, uh, for most of my students as they read this. Melanthus? They hauled him out through the doorway. Remember, he's kind of hung up in the storeroom. That's where they left him. He's not dead. He's just, uh, he's just been tortured. Into the court, they lopped off his nose and ears with a ruthless knife, tore his genitals out for the dogs to eat raw, and in manic fury, hacked off hands and feet. There it is. That's Telemachus. That's the young man who now has grown up. To, to give payback. And what is it that Melanthius did? Well, yeah, he insulted Odysseus, and of course he went and got armor for defenseless men. 
boy, that's really going to raise some questions for us, isn't it? Odysseus then will say to Euryclea, bring sulfur and fire. We need to, we need to purge the, um, the hall of all the killing. Well said, my boy, the nurse replies at 515. Right to the point, but wait, she says, let me fetch you a shirt and cloak to wrap you. No more dwaddling around the palace, nothing but rags to cover those broad shoulders. It's a scandal. In other words, the nurse is like, you're covered in blood and guts. So can I, can I please... Can I please get you um, some some uh, you know clothes? Because Odysseus has just said, um, once we you know use the sulfur, call Penelope here with all the other women, and Odysseus will say, fire first, light me a fire to purify this house. And we're told that she in fact does this. He purges the pot, the halls, and then the fumes, the the cleansing fumes. Then final lines of book twenty two. Back through the royal house, the old warrant nurse went to tell the women the news and bring them in at once. Not Penelope yet. That will be coming next in the next book, 23. They came, the women, crowding out of their quarters, torch in hand, flung their arms around Odysseus, hugged him home at last, and kissed his head and shoulders, seized his hands, and he, amazing line, overcome by a lovely longing, broke down and wept. Deep in his heart, he knew them one and all. Finally, Odysseus allowed to weep, although he's had some tears that he's kind of, finally, after he's slaughtered all these men. Well, let's work level two, three very quickly. Of course, one obvious question is the question of retributive justice. That is to say, do good, get good. Remember at line 396, doing good puts doing get bad to shame. Okay, so one obvious answer is here, Odysseus is in the right. This is one of the major messages of this whole poem. Odysseus is in the right because these suitors have disregarded the will of the gods and therefore they get what they deserve. However, another major message. Think about this. The poet or the singer, that is to say, he who represents the arts, he deserves to be saved. Why? Well, one argument is so that this poet can actually sing the song of Odysseus. Hmm. Finally, of course, a major one, and it's a disturbing one. Watch this. Women are punished for what Odysseus has, in fact, done. Slept with someone who is not his spouse. The moral political questions obviously lead to a critique of the patriarchy. And this will be the first time that we've seen this kind of, uh, this kind of duplicity in regards to moral understandings. Men can do things and get away with it that women cannot. At level 2B, well, the symbolism here, I've, we mentioned it already, the spilled wine, the jacked priest, Leodes, the saved poet, Phemius, all of these are, of course, powerful symbols that represent any number of things. The spilled wine, self-evidently, like the spilled blood, the jacked priest, Leodes, that is to say, didn't do his job and he didn't keep these, man in, these men in line. And then finally, of course, the poet, Phemius, well, we're going to save the poet and we're going to kill the priest. The irony, well, that is obviously an irony there, but the irony is, of course, that the suitors still don't get it. They do not understand. They are, if you will, blinded all the way to the end. And, of course, the other irony is that women are punished for sex that Odysseus enjoyed himself. In level 3A, well, obviously the Iliad, we've mentioned it already. Let's just review. The Odysseus with Laodice scene will bring to mind Odysseus killing Dolan and beheading him in Book 10. And when we messed around with that book in our lecture on Iliad 10, we commented on the moral ambiguity of doing this. Dolan helps give information on the hope that, the assumption that, he will in fact be allowed to be supplicant and not be killed, and Odysseus kills him anyway. Of course, Achilles and like Caon is one of the more disturbing scenes of Book 21, and Achilles feels like he is in the right because Patroclus died. Of course, Patroclus died because Achilles wasn't even in the war. Of course, Book 22 of the Iliad is the killing of, of Hector by Achilles, and here, of course, we have the slaughter in Book 22. We'll mention this as well, that in the Aeneid and in Beowulf, we have serious jack scenes. And of course, I've already mentioned this, but write it down in 3a. Dante will put Odysseus in Inferno, and obviously there's reasons for that that are associated with Book 22. What is your favorite Jack text? Video games, for example. And in many ways, we can ask this question now, is this the source of so much violence in our culture, this fascination with the Iliad and the Odyssey, and especially scenes like this? At 3b, well, obviously the moral question has to be asked. Is this justice? I'll ask several of them. You write them down. You guys decide how you want to answer this. Is this justice? Do you think there was another, a better way? For example, after he's killed the major ringleaders, is there a better or another way? 
And what disturbs you the most? I mean, there's a lot of disturbing stuff in this, right? Okay, but what disturbs you the most in, in your reading of this? And finally, do you see heroic, or do you see Odysseus as heroic? Do you see Telemachus as heroic? Now, obviously, his first kill, and therefore he's grown up, but look what he does to Melanthius at the end of this book. By the way, that treatment of Melanthius is almost never mentioned in summaries of Book 22. It's a little too disturbing to be mentioned, and yet, there it is. We have to, as scholars, as students, we have to challenge ourselves with that idea. Does Melanthius get what he deserves because he treats Odysseus so badly? He kicked Odysseus in the hip, and for that, this is what happens to him. The other personal questions, a time you had to jack somebody for some reason. What was a time you yourself were jacked? A time when you were saved from being jacked? These are all related, obviously. All right, well, that's book 22. We now turn to book 23. We've still got Penelope. And it's interesting that it's a book, 22, that will have so much violence. And then all of a sudden, the violence ends. And they're the repercussions of book 23, 24. The repercussions of all of that. Un unlike the Iliad, where once Achilles kills Hector, that's pretty much it. I mean, obviously, Priam's got to come back and try and reclaim the body of his, of his son, Hector. But for the most part, it's over. And we begin to kind of recognize that Achilles knows that he soon must die because obviously he kills Hector and that's the prophecy. Here we got a different dynamic entirely. Odysseus has done all of this for what reason? Well, obviously vengeance, but more than that, so he can be reunited with Penelope. So what will that be like when finally he's reunited with Penelope? This is, of course, the, um, the whole notion of the way that the poet Homer is able to continue to surprise and shock us because along with Penelope, we still got Odysseus' father, Laertes, that he's going to have to meet. I hope you're enjoying this study and you're challenged as much as am I. Thank you.